Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with all of you. Anybody creeped out a little bit about the topic? It's a good thing we're doing it in the morning and not at night, perhaps. So my goal this morning is to give you a glimpse into the world of the ministry of exorcism and hopefully knowing more about the ministry of exorcism, the reality of the devil, we all come to know that the devil ultimately is no one to fear because we all know that the power of God is greater than the power of the devil. So imagine, if you will, that it's Sunday morning in every major city and small town across the United States, and there's a sound that begins to echo through the air. The sound that we hear is the ringing of church bells, meant to remind all of us that we're called to wake up with God and to be about the things of God. But it's a sad reality today that far too many people seem to be spiritually asleep. Many people who have been baptized have abandoned their faith. They no longer go to church and even identify now as being an atheist. As religion and belief in God are becoming less relevant in the lives of far too many people, there is a great danger for falling for ideas that sound appealing but can be extremely dangerous. St. Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and he deceives many people. And there are many people today who are being deceived. As people are turning a deaf ear to the things of God, there has been an increase in fascination with the devil and the tricks that he uses to lure people into his world of darkness. What all of us need to realize is that our ultimate identity comes from our relationship with God and not apart from him. With God, we have everything, and without God, we have nothing. My primary goal as an exorcist is to help lead people out of Satan's darkness and to bring them into the light of Christ. Many people today live with a distorted view of freedom that echoes the fall of humanity mentioned in the book of Genesis. The guiding principles of this distorted view of freedom are this. You may do whatever you wish. No one has the right to command you, and you are the God of yourself. This viewpoint leaves no room for God, and the end result is a greater presence of evil, both in the world and in the lives of individuals. St. John Paul II said that freedom, in the true sense of the word, means to be obedient to God. When we live in the manner that God created us to live, that is freedom in the true sense of the word. When we get a distorted view of freedom, whereby we believe that we can do whatever we want, then St. John Paul II goes on to say that we end up becoming slaves to our own passions and desires. Pope Benedict put it this way, when the existence of God is denied, freedom is not enhanced, but is deprived of its basis and thus becomes distorted. The devil's purpose is to dismantle religion, civilization, and even to destroy faith. He wants to pull us away from God, and he desires our ruin. One of my favorite definitions of the church is that the church is the guardian to the tree of life. It is a vehicle that God has given to us to enter into paradise and to be in the presence of God the Father for all eternity. The devil believes that if he can destroy the church, faith, and religion, then humanity will be permanently trapped in sin, as are the devil and the other fallen angels. When it comes to the activity of the devil, it can be described as either extraordinary or ordinary. Extraordinary demonic activity is classified under four main categories, demonic infestation, demonic vexation, demonic obsession, and demonic possession. Demonic infestation has to do with the presence of evil in a location or associated with an object, an object that is inherently evil, meaning it was created for the sole purpose of drawing people away from God and into the realm of the evil one. We can think of things like a Ouija board, a voodoo doll, again, things that are inherently evil. 
The second type is demonic vexation, the action by the devil and his demons aimed at attacking and harassing humans physically. There is something called demonic oppression, which are also physical attacks, but demonic op oppression is viewed as a gift from God. God allows one to be afflicted by the devil as an opportunity for that person to show their fidelity to God and as a result to grow in holiness and virtue. One of the great examples is Job out of the Old Testament. God permitted uh, Satan to afflict Job, and we, if you know the story of Job, he's covered in sores, he puts on sackcloth, he sits in ashes, his wife says to him, curse God and die. And how does Job respond? He beats his breast and he says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Meaning if things be good, I glorify God. If things be bad, I glorify God. My personal circumstances mean nothing when it comes to God's rightful place in my life. Padre Peel used to call the devil Old Bluebeard. And he wrote that one night when he was trying to sleep, he woke up and he looked in the corner and said, Oh, it's only you, old Bluebeard. I thought it was somebody important. And then he simply rolled over and went back to sleep. Now, how many of us, if we thought the devil was in our room, that we could do that? But the truth is, any of us should be able to do that if our faith is strong enough and truly solid. The more that we know about the devil, the more we will realize that he has nothing to fear. Demonic obsession has to do with the action by the devil and his demons aimed at attacking humans mentally by influencing a person's external and internal senses. When it comes to demonic obsession, the devil is literally trying to get inside of someone's head. And then finally, we have demonic possession. The action by the devil and demons aimed at taking control of a person's body during which the person feels powerless to act and their actions are now wholly defined by the evil spirits. Whenever a demon manifests, it will use the person's eyes to see, their hands and arms to give gestures, their legs and feet to move. Demonic uh, possession is real. It does occur. It's not very common. Perhaps one out of every 5,000 cases that I deal with is true demonic possession. Most of the cases that I deal with have to do with infestation, vexation, and obsession. The church says that there are four things that I should look for to determine whether or not someone is truly possessed. I'm trained to be a skeptic. I need to reach moral certitude, meaning the person in front of me, beyond a doubt, is truly dealing with extraordinary demonic activity. The things that I look for, the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual. Number two would be strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual, so superhuman strength. Having elevated perception, meaning the person knows things that they should not otherwise know, and that lets me know that it's not really that person who is speaking, but it is the demon now operating through that person's body. And then fourth, an aversion to anything of a sacred nature, such as being blessed with holy water, being shown a crucifix, being, uh, having a relic placed on their head as the prayer is being said, or reading sacred scripture, especially accounts of Jesus casting out demons, or even the prologue of John's gospel, the word became flesh. When it comes to demonic possession, oftentimes the question is, why would the devil be interested in possessing a human body? And the answer is really at the core of our Christian faith. The greatest thing that God has done for us is the incarnation. God took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. And the devil believes in his own twisted sense that he takes on human form each and every time he possesses a person. It's also possible to know that an evil spirit is present when symptoms of the demonic are observed. These include bodily contortions. In Mark 1:26, it reads, 
the evil shook the man violently. There can be a change in the voice, whereby it will become much deeper and authoritative. Mark 5, 5, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. There can be a change in physical appearance, such as foaming at the mouth or the eyes rolled in the back of the head. Unpleasant odors, a change in the temperature of the room, whereby it will become much colder. Laughing, hysteria, hissing, and the resemblance of the movement of a snake, and even levitation. All of these manifestations of the devil are meant to be a distraction, because the devil basically is saying, look at what I can do. But each and every time I pray the rite of exorcism, I'm not focused on what the devil is doing, but using the rite of the church, I'm saying, look at what God wants to do in your life. God wants to free people from demonic influence, and the rite of exorcism is one of the ways that the church does that. Now, many people today are fascinated by the extraordinary activity of the devil. Heads spinning, pea soup flying, and bodies levitating can certainly gain anyone's attention. But while much attention has been given to demonic infestation, vexation, obsession, and possession, little has been said about the ordinary activity of the devil. Very few of us will ever have to deal with extraordinary demonic activity. All of us today do need to be concerned how the devil attempts to attack us in the ordinary circumstances of our lives. The devil will try to attack your marriages, your relationship with your spouse, with your children, your friends, your colleagues at work and school, and in your prayer life. Temptation is at the center of ordinary demonic activity, and he uses a four-stage plan of attack against us. When it comes to ordinary demonic activity, the devil begins with deception. It leads to division, which leads to diversion, which leads to discouragement. On our daily journeys, all of us encounter something or someone who is intelligent, concealed, powerful, destructive, and who wants to intrude on in our lives in a way that is harmful and destructive. It's worth our while to pay attention to these attacks for their primary goal is to fracture our lives in such a way that we are pulled further and further away from God. And just consider today how many people are pulled away from God. A recent study that I read indicated that 79% of Catholics between the ages of 18 and 35 no longer practice their faith. 79% of that age group. And oftentimes when it comes to the ordinary activity of the devil, people have been pulled further and further away from God and they don't even realize it. And the further we are removed from God, the danger is that we lose our sense of identity. The human person has been created in the image and likeness of God. And I believe that all of us have the innate desire for God. And when we don't feed that desire for God is when we get ourselves into trouble. St. Augustine said it best when he said, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. The devil uses his ordinary activity to try and drive a person away from God, whereby they become isolated and susceptible in believing the lies that the devil is presenting to them. The devil wants his lies to become the truth in the minds of the human person. Just consider for a moment these following examples. Have you ever struggled with a coworker who has become difficult to deal with? A longtime friend has become tiresome. It's difficult to pay attention to ordinary conversation. You exert every bit of energy in you to calm a troubled situation. You're surprised to find within yourself 
inclinations towards hostility, violence, lust, and maybe even the desire to exploit someone for your own satisfaction. St. Paul put it this way, I can, do, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do is what I do. Romans 7, 18 through 19. So deception. The devil inverts reality. He turns things inside out and upside down. He wants to pull us off track and then proceeds to present the inversion as a truth. He lies. Again, we go back to the book of Genesis. What did the devil say to Eve? You will not die. You will be like God. When the devil lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All of these deceitful promises have to do with the future. Gratitude looks to the past. Love looks to the present moment. But fear always looks to the future. We want to be in control and to know the outcome. Wanting to know the future is why many people today turn to psychics and medians, somehow believing that they can give them the answers that they want. There is no room for hope and trust when people give in to deception. The end result is that the devil has misled someone and they now find themselves in the midst of scandal or depression. What's the very first thing that Adam and Eve did after they gave in to the lie of the devil? They went and hid. They tried to hide from God. But the good news is whenever we try to hide, whenever we are lost, God is always on the lookout for us. What did God say to Adam after the fall? Adam, where are you? We come to know a God who always is looking for us. We think of the story of the prodigal son, the father who is on the lookout, waiting for his son to return. People today are buying into the lives of the devil, and rather than repenting and owning up to them, they try to justify them. And this leads to the second stage of attack of the ordinary activity of the devil, namely division. Whenever we give in to a lie, we should repent. We turn to God. We come to know that God's mercy and forgiveness is the greatest thing that we can know, certainly greater than any sin that we can commit. But when we allow guilt to get the best of us, again, remember that one of the titles of the devil is that he is the accuser. He is always accusing us, making us feel bad. But each and every time we go to confession, it's not about putting us on a guilt trip, but again, it's about learning the mercy of God. So division. We should not be surprised that the devil directs his energy to division and disunity. He desires to divide people from God, from each other, and from their very selves. The devil works against our very redemption in Jesus Christ, which reconciles us to God and allows us to share in the unity of the Holy Trinity. Do you know what the word redemption means? It means to buy back. When Jesus died on the cross, he brought us back from the lie of the devil when Adam and Eve fell and gave in to original sin. The devil wishes that we would collapse with him into eternal death and everlasting alienation from God. He does this by drawing us into a world of deceit and untruth, whereby we become broken. On the night before he died, Jesus prayed, As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one. The devil's attempts at dividing us represent the counterpoint to Jesus' triumphal work of healing, reconciling, and unifying. The devil wants to stymie us, halt us, 
and even paralyze us on our life's journey of bringing a sense of unity to bear on our existence. He can make us feel overwhelmed as though something is out of our reach, beyond our capacity, so that we will give up. He also stirs up fear to make us feel frightened so that we will withdraw. He can suggest that we compare ourselves to others, usually to the extent that we overestimate the abilities of others and underestimate our own so that we look bad in comparison. He sets us up against each other. Anger, resentment, contempt, greed, avarice. He can make us feel impatient so that we become agitated and dissatisfied. He can short circuit us on our journeys with drugs and various forms of addictions or infidelity. Think of the opioid crisis, alcohol abuse, addiction to pornography, the breakup of the family, abortion, euthanasia, and the list goes on and on and on. The gospel teaches us that we will find our life when we give it back to God who gave it to us. Mark 8:35. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will find it. In order to give our lives to God, we must have something to give. That is, with a sense of unity, integrity, and a coherence about them. We need to have our lives in our hands in order to give them back to God. The devil does not want us to bring the pieces together. If we remain fractured, we are unable to surrender ourselves to God, and this brokenness leads us to the third stage of attack of the ordinary activity of the devil. Certainly, as we go through this journey, if we give in to deception, we need to repent. When we don't repent, it leads to division. When we are broken, we need to repent. And when we don't repent, it leads to diversion. The devil desires that we divert ourselves from the pathway of God. He moved the people of Israel who were on a journey to the promised land away from the worship of the one true God to the worship of false gods. We know in the story of Exodus, they worshiped a golden calf and adopted the pagan practices of the nations around them. We call this idolatry, and it's still a weapon that the devil uses today, substituting a product of our own creation for the uncreated God. Types of diversion, absorption in the task. We fail to see the larger picture and the direction to which God is calling us. We are distracted. Think of the story of Martha and Mary. Martha, Martha, Martha. Again, the distraction of being caught up in work. Another type of diversion by way of contempt. We know what we are called to do, and yet we are repelled by the task at hand. Something pulls us away from what ought to be done. Think of the story of Jonah and the well. God had a job for him to do, and he tried to run away. Another type of diversion, by way of the complete opposite direction. Instead of getting slightly off course, the devil gets the person to move in a completely different direction. When this happens, the original mission gets completely corrupted. Think of David and Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. David gets slightly off course when he commits adultery with his wandering eye. He gives in to lust, but then eventually he gives in to murder when he has Uriah the Hittite killed. Another type of diversion by way of relativism, the sense that nothing really matters. There is no stable truth, no grounding, and there is no specific direction that is right or appropriate. The end result is that one's life becomes a jumble of disconnected bits and pieces, lacking all form and coherence. Think again of those three statements that I made at the beginning. You may do whatever you wish. No one has the right to command you, and you are the God of yourself. 
another type of diversion by way of addiction. We decenter our lives from what, we sh what should be important to us, and we allow something else to take its place, something that demands attention, devotion, cultivation, and sacrifice, all to the detriment of everything else in life, including the most sacred relationships of family, friends, and God. Think of, again of the story of the prodigal son, who basically says to his father, I wish you were dead, because if you were dead, I would get my share of the inheritance that should come to me. Another type of diversion is by way of distraction. The devil wants to interrupt in our communication with God, that is to say, our lives of prayer. Four types of distractions that affect our prayer lives, anxieties and fears about the future. What do we hear in Matthew 6, 25 through 30? Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap. They gather nothing into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are not you more important than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single moment to your lifespan? Why are you anxious about clothes? Learn from the way of the wild flowers that they grow. They do not work or spin. I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was clothed like one of them. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which grows today and is thrown into the oven tomorrow, will he not much more provide for you, O you of little faith? A second type, the offenses that we have suffered at the hands of others. We all know that oftentimes when people have hurt us, we want revenge. We give in to bitterness, anger, and resentment. Psalm 55, listen, God, to my prayer. Do not hide from my pleading. Hear me and give answer. I rock with grief. I groan at the uproar of the enemy, the clamor of the wicked. They heap trouble upon me. Savagely, they accuse me. Another, comparing ourselves both as who we are and what we have with others. This causes us on our journeys to God to focus more and more on others and less on ourselves. This is addressed in the last of the two of the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Coveting has its roots in comparing and desiring. It is an infectious side that can invade our way of thinking, our feelings, in how we shape our patterns of thinking. Another type of thing that affects our prayer lives is being centered on the pleasures of the moment. Pleasure and enjoyment are not forbidden in the Christian life. However, when they become distorted, they can pull us into ourselves. Self-absorption is the danger. Think of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man could literally step over the poor man, Lazarus, who is laying on his doorstep, not even seeing him because he's simply caught up into himself. After we have followed the ordinary activity of the devil through deception, division, diversion, we arrive at the final stage of attack of the ordinary activity of the devil, namely discouragement. I believe that there are more people today who are discouraged than there are people who are depressed. Discouragement has to be the most dangerous threat to the spiritual life. It is evident in the tiredness that marks the faces of so many people today. We see them in the joyless faces of people in supermarkets, in restaurants, walking down a city street, even sitting in the pews on Sunday. It was Pope Francis who said that if we walk around with a long face, if we are not radiating the joy of God, how do we expect anyone to truly embrace the Christian life? The Christian must be someone who radiates the joy of God so that people will look at us and say, I don't know what you have, but whatever it is, 
I hope that it's contagious because I need it in my life. And what we need to be able to say to them is that what radiates joy in me is my relationship with Jesus Christ, and I want to share him with you. In Dante's Divine Comedy, there's a sign at the entrance to hell that reads, Abandon all hope, ye who enter. These words ring true for all those who have been swept into the dark and deep hole of discouragement. Discouragement leads people to make decisions to stop trying, to pull back, to do something else, or even just to come to a halt. Think of the number of people since COVID-19 who have given in to discouragement and who are deciding not to come back to the church. Again, they are caught up in the grip of discouragement. They are focused more on despair rather than on the joy that comes from our relationship with God. Now, all of these things are of such great interest to the devil because he knows that they can destroy us on our journeys to God. In the Christian tradition, discouragement can be seen as asidia. It's a word that comes from the Greek word akadeo, which translates, I don't care. It's one of the capital sins or major temptations of the Christian life that leads to sin. Asidia speaks of things like melancholy, sloth, laziness, especially in regards to religious obligations and practices. It can be the result of things of, like being tired, feeling overwhelmed, intimidated, or going through personal disappointment. If you ask somebody today, how are you? What's the most common response that we'll get? Tired or busy. When people have journeyed through all the stages of the ordinary activity of the devil, and they have arrived at discouragement, I believe that they have arrived at a crossroads. It is a defining moment in their life. Will they take the path that leads to death, always spiritual, but sometimes physical? Think of the growing trend of suicide in our society today. But again, we are a people of hope. We are a people of faith. The other pathway I call discipleship. We have a reawakening. We come to realize the rightful place that God needs to have in our lives, and we give God that rightful place. Giving God his rightful place doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect, but it does mean that God will be with us on our journeys, and he will give us the strength that we need. Psalm 23, my favorite word, depending on the translation that you use, in that psalm is the word through. Even though I walk through the valley of darkness, it lets us know that in our lives, we will experience darkness, but the darkness will not overcome us. We will overcome it because God is walking with us in the midst of the darkness of our lives. So when it comes to discipleship, it makes me think of the call of St. John Paul II to the new evangelization. Again, the need to wake up. I began my presentation by saying that the ringing of church bells is meant to be a reminder that we need to wake up and to be about our faith. And certainly today, there are many people who are spiritually asleep. And all of you gathered here today, hopefully the reason that you are here is that you want to wake up even more to the important role that God must play in your lives, and then how as husbands and fathers and grandfathers and uncles and brothers and on and on and on, that you can help motivate other people in coming to know the important role that God needs to play in our lives. What should be our response to the ordinary activity of the devil? The gospel gives us a remedy. It proposes that on our spiritual journey that we should expect struggles and disappointment, but that our fears be properly aligned. In other words, fear God and not the devil. And what does it mean to be a God-fearing person? 
It means to live in awe of God, to be able to say, wow, look at what God is doing in my life. Look at what God is doing in the world. So we need to hold to confidence. We need to stay the course. We need to have confidence in the Holy Spirit who will lead, guide, and direct those experiencing the ordinary activity of the devil. And again, I would propose that each and every one of us every day has to face the ordinary attacks of the devil. And again, we must identify with Jesus Christ. In the Christian context, we cannot speak of evil or the devil apart from our reference to our faith in Jesus Christ, who has conquered the power of evil through his death and resurrection. All of us need to look to the healing and redeeming work of Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So if anyone is struggling, and again, that's all of us, some of the best practices, the remedies can be found within our Catholic faith. We need to regularly attend Mass and receive Holy Communion. We need to seek out a regular confessor for the sacrament of penance. We need to spend time in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. That time is not wasted, but it is allowing us to invest ourselves even more and more and more into our relationship with God. We need to incorporate Marian devotions into our daily routines. The Blessed Mother is a powerful ally for anyone who is up against the forces of evil. I did an exorcism in southern Indiana. I commanded the demon to say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the words from the beginning of, the, of Luke's gospel. The demon looked at me and laughed and said, Grace of full, scrambled the words, but refused to say the name of our Blessed Mother. Mary is a powerful ally. She says yes to God. She teaches us obedience to God. I told people at my parish on the feast of the, uh, the Mother of God on January the 1st that the true GOAT, the G-O-A-T, is not a quarterback that began in New England and ended up in Tampa Bay. The true G-O-A-T is our Blessed Mother. She is the greatest of all time, and we need to rely on her powerful intercession. We need to use scripture for prayer and reflection, especially the prologue of John's gospel. We need to include other devotions, such as prayers to patron saints. We need to use sacramentals, such as holy water, blessed salt, blessed objects, and sacred images. The devil has power, and he can only be defeated by power. The power that defeats the devil is the power of God, and the ministry of exorcism is one of the ways and the tools that the church uses to call upon that power of God to defeat the devil. Again, all of us have to contend with the devil. He has extraordinary and ordinary activity, but he is nothing compared to the power of God. And being here today, hopefully each and every one of you will unite yourselves even more deeply to the power of God, and in doing so, grow in holiness, faith, and virtue.